So, um, I'm going to talk about Postgres over the next 20 years. <clears throat> um, so let's answer the first question that some of you may have, which is, why would I listen to this guy? <clears throat> so, there's a Riggs logo at the bottom of the screen, and what I intend that to mean is not some huge comeback, as everybody keeps teasing me about uh, uh, ever since I arrived. Uh, what it means is I'm speaking uh, from my own personal opinion. Uh, I'm not speaking as an officer of the Postgres project. I'm not speaking on behalf of any company that I've worked with or have an association with. So this is an independent viewpoint um, that has been invited. Uh, and I'm going to do, to the best of my ability, uh, uh, to give you a viewpoint of what's going to happen over the next 20 years. <clears throat> so what's the starting point for that? <clears throat> well, right now, Postgres has become number one. Postgres is the most popular database for professional developers. It's the most admired database for professional developers, and it's the most desired database by developers. And it's the most desired database by a long, long way. Now, where do these facts come from? From the Stack Overflow survey. Now, Stack Overflow isn't uh, some kind of industry body. Uh, many people did not vote in that survey, but it's probably the most uh, even-handed uh, opinion, set of opinions out there. There are other measures published, uh, but there's things like marketing dollars influence those results. So whereas I don't believe these results are particularly influenced uh, by anything in marketing, certainly I can assure you that nobody in Postgres spent a single dollar trying to get these results, okay? Uh, so that's one thing that you can be certain of. <clears throat> and so what we see is, over the last 20 years, uh, we come from a situation where Postgres was the most advanced open source database, uh, but others claimed to be the most popular. And over the course of 20 years, we've moved from that situation to a very solid number one position uh, in the marketplace, whatever that means. Okay, that's a kind of marketing term, but uh, it's, it's a term that's important to, to all of us. <clears throat> so what I'd like to do just for a minute is get everybody that contributed to Postgres by 2004, just stand up, please. Hanu, that's you, I know, so everybody else. <clears throat> and that definitely includes you too, so come on. That's at least three people standing up, and I can't see all the way to the back. So that's not many people. We've either got some fairly shy people, or there's just simply not that many people involved. Now, keep standing. What I'd like to ask you, if you used Postgres back in 2004, also stand up. <clears throat> and the real thanks for this goes to all of you, because in those early days, uh, it, it wasn't the contributors that were so important. It, it was the users, because uh, replying uh, to feedback about bugs or missing features or things that were needed. But look around you. Look how the community has grown over 20 years. <clears throat> and my first and obvious comment is, uh, over the next 20 years, it's going to change again by the same amount. Okay, so the, the community around Postgres is going to be very, very large. Thank you very much. Please, please sit down. So let's have a look uh, in more detail at the, uh, uh, the results of that survey. <clears throat> the first thing to note is that we are number one in that survey, but only just. There are some other people directly uh, behind. But the point and the reason I mention it now is that this is quite a slow burn. Postgres has been creeping upwards very slowly over time. And that's particularly important because it's a significant trend. It's not just a data blip 
that happened one year and, and then it won't happen again. Okay, so this is a significant long-term change in people's thinking and behavior, and that will probably continue. <clears throat> um, but we are the most popular database used by professional developers. What that misses is the fact that even in that survey, there are still 30,000 people that need to be persuaded that actually Postgres is quite a good thing. Okay, 30,000 people, and there's only a few hundred of us here. Okay, so uh, if I've got my maths right, what's that? 50 times the number of people that are here, right? It's a lot. That's a lot of people still to persuade. And more so, 24% of the people that, who were learning to code thought Postgres was, uh, was the top. And so not only have we got work to do on other uh, existing professionals, we've got a lot of work to do on people entering uh, the profession, okay? <clears throat> uh, and if you, you flip the numbers the other way, you'll see that even on the most admired statistic, there's still tens of thousands of people to persuade that Postgres is a good product and can meet their needs. Looking even deeper, uh, is some statistics on the net movement of people between technologies. And I'm pleased to say that in the main uh, case, people are coming towards Postgres from every other database. The only one that isn't true is Redis. Uh, so I guess you know, maybe congrats to them. But that's trending downwards over time. So uh, even that statistic is coming in favor uh, of Postgres. So it doesn't matter whether we're talking about MySQL, MariaDB, SQLite, everybody is coming over to Postgres. <clears throat> so that's a very strong movement of people, but there are people moving away from Postgres. And one thing that we need to consider and uh, find out in more detail is people are leaving Postgres. Why are they leaving Postgres? Let's go and find out, and let's make sure, not that they're trapped in Postgres, because it's an open door, but if there's something that's not being done, then we want to do that for you. That's a feature that we want to add to the database, okay? Um, so this is a software product that's usable and used uh, in millions of servers now all across the world, in every country, and it's helping people with all parts of their lives. If we are not helping people, then we need to do more to find out what was missing and to add that in. So that's the first part of the analysis. <clears throat> but what I offered to you was to tell you what was going to happen over the next 20 years. Now, um, my starting point for that uh, was, of course, the foundation trilogy, uh, a, a book that I or a set of books that I read when I was younger, not because there's a TV series uh, on now. <clears throat> and in that uh, series, uh, uh, the, uh, the guy, <clears throat> Harry uh, Selden, developed a way of looking forwards to finding out what was going to happen in the future. <clears throat> and it was all about what's happening to people. I'm not able to predict individual actions or events or features that will occur over the next 20 years. Not really possible. If I tried, <clears throat> you'd certainly laugh. Maybe not next year, but certainly by 18 years or 20 years, you'd wonder what I was talking about 20 years ago. And you probably still will. But what I'd like to do is look at things in terms of human trends. <clears throat> and I'd like to see these popularity changes between products as actually movements of people. These are movements where people that don't necessarily know much about the technology have heard of it, but they trust it, and they're moving towards it. And people also investing their careers in it. If you're going to be learning uh, a technology uh, that has a manual with 3,000 pages in it, that's a lot of commitment from people into learning a body of knowledge. And so your choice of career over the next 20 years uh, is an important one. It's obviously going to support your lives 
uh, your families, your children. And so it's an important decision for people to make. And so people don't make that change lightly. They make it uh, with lots of consideration. And that's the type of consideration that we would take into account, but also what, that we would want to encourage. <clears throat> now, the last point uh, that I'd like you to consider is actually economics, because everything I've talked about so far is popularity, and we know that that can change in an instant, okay? But what doesn't change is the economic situation. Is it easy to use Postgres? Is it cheap to use Postgres? Is it cheap to extend Postgres in various ways? And cheap can mean many things. It can actually mean a dollar amount, uh, or guess, or a euro amount, um, but it can also mean just simply how easy is it? How much effort does it take to do certain things? And some of you not involved in development may not know this, but the actual course of development of Postgres was very greatly influenced by economic issues. And if you look back through some of the things uh, Tom Lane uh, wrote in the early days, he was very uh, uh, strict with himself about not spending too much time. There's always lots of comments saying like, we can extend this later, we can do this later. Yeah? So lots of get the feature in, in its basic form, and then move it forwards later. Or more importantly, encourage other people to get involved, to let them extend it. And those same thoughts apply here. So what uh, do we have uh, with Postgres? Well, I call it a multi-model database. And uh, Michael Stonebreaker's original concept for Postgres was uh, a database that allowed you to plug in different data types. It allowed you to have pluggable functions so that users could write their own. Now, that concept of users, what that meant in research terms was not end users. We're not going to let quickly run up a C function in order to extend the database. What it meant was domain-specific experts could extend the database in the ways that they wanted to see. So if you're working in bioinformatics or geographical information systems, you can extend the database in that direction, okay, using your expertise uh, and the power of Postgres. And what we've done over the last 30 years it has been to extend that concept even further. What we've added is pluggable executor, uh, pluggable optimizer. So you can actually replace the internals of Postgres now with new and different subsystems. Uh, but we've also got pluggable indexes um, and pluggable table access methods. But the most important thing is the extension itself, the ability to simply say uh, create extension and then give it a name, and that's all you need to do to load uh, that extension automatically into the database. Now, that level of extensibility is second to none. There's nothing else anywhere that can be extended that quickly and that easily. And what that means is, from a user perspective, it's easy to use new extensions that have been developed. Okay? So when you're writing a program, you can just say, make sure it's got that extension loaded. But as an extension developer, uh, you can see that it's easy to add new code when you see the need for it. And what that means is that all of the venture capital people and many of uh, the consultants and people surrounding the database community know that if you want to create new database functionality or specialized new features, you can add it to Postgres more quickly, more cheaply than any other database. Okay? And as a result, uh, I've highlighted it in green. This is my most important statement, uh, is that most, if not all, database use cases can be met by Postgres plus extensions. Okay? And that's an important conclusion. Uh, now, uh, one of the things that we're also going to talk about is 
uh, some of the things that Mike Stonebreaker was talking about, because 20 years ago, he was saying, well, actually, the best thing to do is to have a database that's specifically designed for each use case. And that's what you can have. You can, you can extend and modify Postgres so that it is exactly tuned to a specific use case. So you can have the same Postgres extended this way or that way, okay? And so instead of needing to redesign a whole database from scratch, you can do that simply with extensions, okay? And so the natural conclusion of everything that's happening here is that Postgres is the platform on which you can build any database, okay? A very important conclusion. Now, even more so uh, are some other related conclusions. When we manipulate data in our databases, Postgres has become uh, the most important system of record for new data. Many new data applications are built using Postgres. Now, that data needs to be analyzed. That's why we're keeping it, okay? It isn't just to keep track of where a, a widget is or what status of a process we're in. It's to keep track of how well that process is being performed. And so analytics has always been critical to the database uh, uh, situation. And so what I see is that analytics is moving more and more towards where the data is kept. So we don't need or want to export the data and transport it to some data warehouse, uh, you know, miles away and, and hours away to load that data. If you want to run analytics up to the second, you run it inside the database that's holding that data. And so what we see is, as Postgres is getting bigger, we're actually um, bringing new use cases for analytics towards Postgres, not pushing them away, bringing them towards. And people that talk about, oh, we don't do systems of record, we do systems of engagement. Well, everything you need is in Postgres, right? So systems of engagement are also moving towards Postgres. So Postgres is capable of every database use case and every aspect of that use case, okay? And that's a very powerful conclusion because what's going to happen over the course of 20 years is that Postgres will provide options and extensions to fully and successfully address every use case, okay? Now, this sounds incredible because right now, if you look on DB Engines, we've got 340-something databases out there. And what I'm saying is, over the course of 20 years, there's going to be a lot of uh, accumulation, uh, aggregation, uh, and we're going to end up with, mostly, in the future, everything will be Postgres, in much the same way as Linux has replaced almost every other operating system. Uh, and over the course of 20 or 30 years, no one talks about anything but Linux now, okay? Uh, apologies to our friends in uh, BSD who continue to contribute to operating system research. But the reality is everything is, is Linux. And the same thing will happen in the world of Postgres. Okay? So over the course of 20 years, we've moved from obscurity to popularity. And what we are now uh, going to move from is popularity to complete pervasiveness. Okay? <coughs> And what I also see is that Postgres is admired by 71% of developers. That's going to increase as we do more and more. So that's going to go up, and the popularity will also increase to that level. So if you think 49% popularity is high, no, it's going to go to 80% popularity because these are seismic shifts of large groups of population. This is not just a whim by people. This is people investing their whole careers in particular technologies. And you can see that everything is moving in this particular direction. Now, that may be considered to be a good thing, but what it certainly is, is a big thing, okay? 
uh, and you can see that actually uh, the postcodes community is going to have to cope with tens of thousands of new people coming into the community, asking questions, wanting things, uh, obviously having coffee, but that's a sort of trivial thing. But it's the usage of database. We're going to see literally tens of thousands of people coming towards Postgres. Many new companies, look at the list of sponsors. It, part, it was over three pages, uh, the list of sponsors. And they're the people that paid to have their name up there. There were more sponsors than that. <coughs> And of course, Postgres code and the community will grow and change to meet these seismic shifts. So that's my prediction, is over the course of 20 years, we're going to move from popularity to pervasiveness, and the community and everybody involved is going to uh, more than double in size, and it's going to uh, uh, force changes in many of the ways that we do things. So what exactly is Postgres? <clears throat> well, postgresql.org is the database server. And it's easy very often to imagine that that is the database. Um, now, Postgres core contains many different contrib modules, many recommended extensions, and it also contains things like the JDBC driver project and is protected uh, by a security team. But what I see over the last few years is that we've increased the number of committers in uh, the team, and that's been over quite a long period of years. But the rough output of the Postgres core team is not significantly increasing. Uh, it's actually been relatively static. Now, that sounds like a bad thing. Um, but uh, we've been having uh, on the order of three to 400 new features, many of them small, but all of them important to users. Um, and that has been happening year on year on year. So every single year, we've released a new version of the database with this uh, significant number of features. So over the course of 20 years, you can see that we've uh, released many thousands of features. And so you can see over the next 20 years, there will also be many more thousands of features. But that's not enough for me, because if you think about what I'm saying, is that Postgres will become pervasive, and there are many different use cases coming towards Postgres. So what that means is there's more code needs to be written in the next 20 years than was written in the previous 20 years. So how do we accelerate the amount of code that's coming towards the project? Well, the first thing to realize is that most of the code that's being written for Postgres is already being developed outside of the core of the project. There's, if you look on GitHub now, there's dozens of projects that do all sorts of things for Postgres. Okay, new functions, new modules, new tools being developed all the time for Postgres. And some of them are uh, sexier than others, and some of them have got talks in this conference. Uh, but out there now, there's many, many tools. And if you're a Postgres user, and you're probably using Postgres via uh, a cloud service, that's a, a very frequent uh, situation now, it's completely normal to include extensions within your database from, uh, uh, from outside the core, okay? Uh, but you don't perceive that they're outside the core because your perception is basically that all of these things together form the Postgres environment, okay? <clears throat> so how and where should uh, people publish their software uh, projects because the compatibility and security and quality are things that judge us, uh, uh, or people judge us uh, as part of Postgres. <clears throat> so one of the things that I'd like to suggest is that uh, Postgres develops uh, the idea of sub-projects uh, within uh, Postgres, much the same as, as happened within Apache or CNCF. Let people publish their work 
under the banner of Postgres, under the license of Postgres, and under the protection of uh, uh, many parts of the Postgres project, and yet allow them to be developed independently. Uh, and that's how we will write all of the code that we need to get written in the next 20 years. So, how uh, do we get there? Well, I've outlined a number of high-level action areas uh, that need to be taken. Uh, higher quality, improved features, and better persuasion. Now, each of these areas is important to achieving what our users want, uh, which is a fully functional environment that does many things. Now, the most easy and trivial thing, really, is finding out it exists, okay? Uh, for example, uh, the full text capabilities of Postgres are phenomenal. But how many people actually know that? Okay, very few. And actually, people are still using other tools that are less capable just simply because they didn't know. Okay, so not only is there more work to do in terms of quality and features, but we have to tell people more about how good Postgres is, how good it already is. And so, <clears throat> what we, uh, what I've outlined here is some points uh, for higher quality. Um, we need to have some fault injection tests. We'd like to see uh, the tests hit 100% on many of the modules. And most importantly, we need uh, performance regression tests that cover realistic use cases. <clears throat> and I've made some other uh, comments as well. So Postgres quality is absolutely exceptional, but I think that we can go even better still. Features. Well, one of the things uh, that, that I see is that there's a, a tension, sometimes even a conflict, between improving the feature set of Postgres and keeping the high level of quality that we've achieved. And I can see that as discussions begin about including things like direct I.O. Uh, within core, it's easy to see that massive changes to one of the subsystems is going to cause a drop in quality in some of the other components. And so what I think that we need is versioned subsystems uh, so that if somebody wants to use the old version of the heap, they can, because they know it's stable. And that is very similar to the way that uh, within Linux, we had ext1, ext2, ext3. And those new subsystems were developed ahead of time. Um, but uh, if people wanted to stick to stable versions of those subsystems, they were easily able to do so. Now, I'm not talking about just a simple parameter where you say, oh, I'll use the old version. Because if somebody's hacked that code, they will have introduced bugs. So I, if I want to use a stable system, I want to be using the stable one that no one's touched. Okay? So having version subsystems will allow uh, that change. We can push forwards on new features while at the same time allowing stability uh, for those that want it. <clears throat> and what I also hope is that um, the... Uh, types of committer that we have uh, can also grow and change so that we can actually extend the number of uh, people committing code in various areas without giving them absolutely access to everything. It's been suggested before, but I'm just reiterating that now. So, features. There's lots of cool new features that we can suggest. Uh, partial indexes that work with limit multiple table indexes, historical database features. There are many cool features that will be developed over the next 20 years, and I'm not the one to be able to name all of those things. It's just simply not possible. But what I would note is that many of the good ideas are already out there. They have already been suggested, and they were just dropped for various reasons. They can be picked up again. Um, and 
I think there are hundreds of already discussed features that can be worked on. But what I think that we need to work on in order to, to achieve uh, uh, what I'm talking about with pervasiveness of Postgres is we need big new features. And there's this wonderful quote uh, from a lady that uh, led um, as president one of the African countries. Uh, if your dreams don't scare you, they aren't big enough. Okay? And so what I'd like you to think about is some big new features for Postgres because that is particularly important. And I'd like to uh, give credit to Heike, uh, uh, Heike Linakangas, who recently suggested uh, that we have multi-threaded Postgres. I personally don't like the idea, but I, I uh, give applause to it because it's a big new feature. It's a major project. He is capable of it, and many other big features are also out there. We have many competent people who can do these big new features. So think big, go for it. No SQL features. Why don't we have an in-memory hash table? If people are using Redis because they want uh, some kind of cache, why don't we have that within Postgres? Within core Postgres, we have a hash table. We use it for everything, but we don't expose it to users. Why not? Why not have an in-memory hash table with an unlogged table? Give people something that they want. But there's many directions to go in. Embedded Postgres, small Postgres, big Postgres. There's lots of different things that we can still do to Postgres. So Postgres is nowhere near feature complete. Okay? It's going to take at least 20 more years to achieve that. And it, I think it could well be more than that. But more importantly, uh, there are some bugs to fix. Okay? If I have a security uh, problem, I report it to the security team, and they will fix it. Okay? If I've got a performance problem, there's no performance team. Right? There's nowhere to report it. There is nowhere a list of performance problems. And seeing as I see you all taking photos of that, I'll quickly move on. Okay, <laughs> and you can speak to me afterwards. There are still significant behavioral problems with parts of Postgres, in particular use cases, and these need to be worked on. Okay, they're bugs. Okay, my idea of a bug is something that does something that you didn't like, uh, it caused an operational problem. It doesn't have to be a seg fault for it to be an operational issue, for it to require work. Now, the issue is that if it's a small problem, somebody can come up with a fix like this. If it's a big problem, then it might take years to fix, and you still need to go for it. You still got to address those things, even if they're big. Okay? There are also issues with scalability that we can address. Okay? They, just because we haven't thought of how yet doesn't mean we can't actually tackle the problem, consider the problem. And one day, there will be solutions to all of these things. And I encourage everybody not to get too confident that Postgres is number one. Therefore, we are doing everything right. That conclusion does not follow. It just means we're number one. Right? That's the only thing it means. Okay? You still need to ask stupid questions, and wonderful new users are full of them. Why don't you do it this way? Why don't you do that? Why doesn't it work like this? And to be honest, I don't have answers. They're good questions. They're good ways to think about the problem. There's many new and interesting things out there for Postgres to do, and listening to these types of questions at this conference is what you should be doing. So while you're having a coffee, while you're having a beer, talk to each other about what the actual problems are. Try to voice what your requirements are, okay? Much more specifically. Don't come up with a design, just come up with uh, some kind of a question. That, and the question will guide you. And the last thing we need is better persuasion. I don't mean that 
uh, the wrong way around, the last thing we need. No, it is very important. We need to persuade people. We need Magnus's presentation that describes the release. That should be available on the postgres.org uh, website because it's an excellent presentation and it needs to be part of the release process. Okay? We can't just say, oh, that's fine, we've done the release notes. We don't need to tell them any more than that. There's lots of things that we need to do. We need to reach out to new developers. We need to reach out to the other teams. There's already some work, for example, with uh, working cl more closely with the Django team, but there's dozens of other projects out there that need some form of regular contact uh, and better integration. Uh, and engagement. Um, I'm sorry at an in-person conference to say this, but we need online conferences because there are so many people in the Postgres community now that even the people here today uh, at the biggest conference has ever been, well, the community's grown even more. So the people here today are only 1% or 2% of the total number of people involved in Postgres. And those people need to know things about Postgres. So we need to engage with those people. This is massively under-resourced, and if you'd like to get involved, this is an area that needs a lot of consideration. If I'm going to be doing anything from now on to do with Postgres, it will be in this area, not in code contributions, or running businesses, or anything like that. Okay, So this is uh, an area that I might focus on, but I might not. I'm happy. <laughs> so what's my summary? There's a long to-do list of features requested and desired requiring many contributors. Every new feature brings new users to Postgres if it's properly publicized. We should be aiming for 80% popularity and aiming to perform 99% or even more of the use cases that are out there. And doing that requires specialized code. It's impossible to have one database that does everything. But it is possible to have one database that has multiple extensions that together can do everything. In order to get there, Postgres must change and grow to cope with the massive new community. And there's been some change over the last 20 years, but there's, gonna, there's a bigger need for change now. And the good thing is, many of the things that happen in other projects uh, that, uh, that I've mentioned there, uh, there's good lessons to learn. Not every situation is perfect, and we could always find a, a negative case of, oh, I don't want to be like them because, fine, fine. But there's many good things that have happened in other projects, and that thinking can be taken on board within Postgres to the benefit of the Postgres community. So my conclusion, uh, before I'm cut short, uh, is that uh, PostgreSQL is alive, it's well, it's growing, and it's becoming increasingly popular. Okay? It isn't just number one, it's going beyond that. And there is a long future of improvement ahead. So what I say to everybody that's come here today, thank you very much for being here, is your career is safe if you spend the next 20 years with Postgres, okay? But your career will be even better if you contribute in some way to that growth over the next 20 years. 20 years ago, I was a consultant, not a developer. I didn't come to Postgres as a professional developer that had worked on anything else. In fact, there, there was simply no code from me in any of the big databases 20 years ago. And 20 years later, uh, I've contributed quite widely to Postgres. Now, you may not want to contribute that much, but it doesn't matter. Every one of you has got an important contribution to make to Postgres because everybody in the room here has at least one thing that only they know, okay? And if you contribute that to the body of knowledge, then Postgres and your lives will be easier 
as a result. Many of the features that are coming out in Postgres are small little options that help you do your job. Now, our job is important. We're helping manage the world's data. Sounds boring, sounds dry, but this is saving people's lives. It's moving food to where it needs to be. It's helping people get the justice that they need in criminal justice systems. It's helping all parts of our society and the millions of Postgres servers are making a real difference to people's lives, even if they don't know what a database is, okay? And one part of our job is to make sure that that continues. So PostgreSQL is democratizing data for the benefit of everybody. And we have the privilege of being involved in that process, making sure that the good things in the world are happening as a result of proper access to data that allow people to live their lives. So please contribute to Postgres in the next 20 years, whether that be improving the quality by reporting bugs, whether it be contributing new features or suggestions for new features to Postgres, or three, simply persuading other people through blogs, books, articles, talks, or any other way that you can think of to persuade people that Postgres is worth using. Your contribution matters, and it improves your own life and your own career. So please get involved through the course of uh, this conference, meet people, talk about things, and please get involved with Postgres. So that's where I'm going to leave it. Um, I think we might have time for some questions. Um, what I am going to do is I'm going to put up uh, some information uh, on uh, my website about the to-do list that I think is still needed. Uh, and I'm also going to occasionally write some blog uh, information. For me, this is uh, catharsis, okay? This is allowing me to get everything out of my head that's, that I realize has been stored up there. Uh, so I might write some other blogs, I might write some other books, but Thomas, there is no big reveal, right? I'm not coming back. <laughs> I am retired, okay? So <clears throat> um, thank you very much, and I hope you enjoy the conference. So. Now it's working. So we have time for one question, maybe. I have one question. So, Simon, <laughs> you, mentioned, you mentioned Heike Lina Gangas, who in 20 more years is going to be close to retirement if he doesn't retire too soon, as we agreed that you did. How are we going to bring more core developers or code developers? You mentioned a little bit of some ideas, but if you can expand <coughs> on that, please. Uh, well, certainly it's about uh, starting. You have to make that first step yourself. Uh, and once you've made that first step yourself, uh, there are resources, there are people that will help you, uh, mentor you in how to contribute better to the community. There was, there was a time when I had not contributed a single patch. What I did was I just got involved in conversations and rather usefully, and one of the reasons I've put this to-do list up, is on the to-do list at that time, at the very top of the to-do list, it said priority, point in time recovery, we really need this. And I wasn't particularly interested in point-in-time recovery, but I thought if it's important, then I should work on it. And so one of the things I've hoped to do with the to-do list here is actually uh, produce some small items that people can work on uh, to gain more experience and build up uh, the experience that they would one day need to become committers, okay? So it's not an instant process, it's not magic, it's just simply get involved and work towards it over a period of years, okay? It took me at least five years to become a committer, um, and uh, I'm not sure I could ever claim to be a good one. Uh, so, um, you know, it, it will take a lot of time and experience and dedication to, to do that, so. Okay. Thank uh, you, sir. <coughs> so, 
There is a question here, Vic uh, has there. Okay, so. Yeah. Um, so, were you asking a question? I have a question here. So, I, I was wondering, uh, what are the biggest threat to achieve your uh, vision in 20 years? The biggest things uh, in the way? The biggest threats to achieving the vision that you have for Postgres in the next 20 well, years. Well, the, the, the threat is, is, the, uh, is, is a kind of business term. When we talk about SWOT analysis, uh, when you're considering things from the perspective of a single company, we talk about opportunities and threats, okay? This is not the situation in an open source project. We don't have a threat. What we have is many thousands of people that we would like to welcome into this community. And so treating, uh, putting out a list of threats or uh, people that we uh, objectify as our enemies, this is completely wrong-headed viewpoint, okay? We want to provide everything that people need from a database. And we want to welcome everybody, no matter what their current thinking is, into this community. Okay? So I definitely don't have a list of threats uh, to Postgres. Uh, there's certainly some challenges and some changes that need to be made. Uh, but these are things that happen every year. The organizational changes uh, uh, that are made, they're, they're, they're made, they're considered every year, right? So this will happen as a natural process, okay? <clears throat> so it's a, it's a big thing to say, but we want everybody in the world to use Postgres, right? It sounds silly, it sounds like some kind of dream, but it's a reality, it can happen. We can meet the needs of a great number of people, okay? That is, that's an achievable goal within the next 20 years. Okay, so we don't have more time for questions, so, but Simon is going to be here until tomorrow. So if you have questions for him, come talk to him. We got a 30 minutes break now, and last applause for Simon. Thank you very much.